That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about our 10 least favorite releases of 2021, of which there's a combined list of just 10. Combined list, and we have reviews available for all of our selections, so I'll put those in the description. All right, number 10 is a mini series. <laughs> yes, Nine Perfect Strangers, uh, directed by Jonathan Levine, with an all star cast led by Nicole Kidman. Also, Nine Perfect Strangers should have had nine episodes. It only had eight. That bothered me so much. And I feel like I wasted so much time watching those eight episodes. We did, and I'm glad they didn't have nine because that would have been another useless hour True. from these storytellers. Ah. <sighs> You know, j just short quips, but I, it just felt like whoever wrote it is like lives in a bubble and whatever they think is edgy or it just was so bland and d and dumb. And Nicole Kidman playing a Russian. We have reviews for all eight episodes. Mm -hmm. And up until the final episode, I was like, they're going to tell us she's not really Russian. I was hoping they would. Because her for Russian her, accent is not great. Sake. And she looks crazy as hell uh, trying to play this character. And no, it and, was legit. And I do really like Nicole Kidman and will really watch anything. Uh, yeah, she's a, a person of interest. I, I want to see the project she takes on. But this was no oh, good. Poor Regina Hall. Uh, you know, Melissa McCarthy, I find grading in general. And she didn't disappoint. Um, who's the man she's in? Bobby the, Cannavale. He, that character made no damn... Just these characters made no sense. I think I was really disappointed in how grating Michael Shannon was when he's singing... Uh, is it Grease? Well, yeah, well, to his daughter uh, while he's wearing boxer shorts in the bedroom. Um, and then his family's dynamic with the dead son and how they can't get over it. It just was all... The micro-dosing. It, oh. it, it looked too glossy. There was no menace. Um, Regina dancing to Xanadu. I don't... A mess. It was a mess. It was not good. Number nine. Crisis, directed by Nicholas Jarecki. A film that I insisted be on this list, uh, but you've forgotten all about. I know that it's about uh, a young guy and his two friends, adjacent, a, uh, a girl and a gay guy, are, who... Well, the, I think the guy's gay in real life, maybe. I don't know. I didn't mean to out this person. But uh, the... Uh, this guy starts a website where he sells drugs. No, kind of... no, no. That's Silk Road. Oh. Is Silk Road on our list? No, we well, was going to be number 10. We put Nine Perfect Strangers. Oh, there. Silk Road's number 11. <laughs> crisis is with Army Hammer. It's also about drugs. It's about the opioid crisis. Directed by Nicholas Jarecki, Gary Oldman, <laughs> Michelle Rodriguez, Evangeline Lilly. Oh my God. Uh, it's one of those narratives where there are like sort of like three POVs mm -hmm. and I just found the three stories it's just criminal how these three different plot points converge in such a dull way and then the one of them doesn't even fit with the other two mm -hmm. the Gary Oldman thing doesn't fit with the other two it, it where he's mean, where he's at odds with Veronica Ferris who I find so odd in English but anyhow yeah okay number eight <laughs> <laughs> Those Who Wish Me Dead, uh, directed by Taylor Sheridan, starring um, Angelina Jolie. And uh, side note, his it didn't quite make this list, but Taylor Sheridan, uh, uh, what's the film with Michael B. Jordan? Uh, Tom Clancy's Without Remorse, you know, kind of gets should get an extra mention as well. Oh, well, um, Those Who Wish Me Dead... The biggest problem I have with that film is the casting of Angelina Jolie. She looks crazy as hell playing this like jumper, like mm -hmm. like the firefighters who jump into the fire. Ugh. Yes, uh, John Bernthal. It's so distracting. Uh, and then she's charged with helping this child who's being hunted by some bad guys, one of who's played by Nicholas Hoult. Uh, and I forget who the other one is now off the top of my head. But yeah, it's just it's just not good. Not entertaining. All right. Number seven. Infinite, directed by Antoine Fuqua, who also had two films this year. And notably, I really didn't like the other one either, uh, which was The Guilty, starring Jake Gyllenhaal, a remake of a Danish film. Uh, that film didn't make our list. But Infinite, starring um, Mark Wahlberg in Chiwetel Ejiofor, amongst many other people, is here. You know, time travel shit is always a little... 
you know, can get convoluted very quickly if it's not well done or it's not kept simple. And this one fails. Uh, God, there's so... Watch our review of it. There's just so much that made no damn sense to me. And uh, it was a bear to get through. It was, yes. Number six. Red Notice, directed by Ross and Marshall Thurber. This movie was a hit for Netflix. And an expensive film for Netflix. But I just thought it was like, you know, Ryan Reynolds... Dwayne Johnson and Gal Gadot Mm -hmm. or Godot. I think it's Gadot. They just, it's like they're on autopilot. They're on cruise control at a low speed. They're on speed two cruise control. (laughs) I enjoyed speed two cruise control more than Red Notice. Oh, I don't know. Uh, Yeah, it's just, just a, a, a really bad screenplay, which is so like all that money and these A-list people... Bad screenplay with little direction for actors that are depending on their own shtick that they bring to almost every role. Yeah. But it was a hit, so... Whatever. What do we know? Number five. I hated this movie. The Tomorrow War, directed by Chris McKay, uh, starring Chris Pratt. The premise didn't make sense to me. Like, we know that in the future we're going to, we're going to be overrun by these alien creatures... So we're sending people now to fight this tomorrow war. But I just kept thinking like, well, if we know this is happening, why don't we just prepare for the day instead of trying to fight them in the future? Because we're losing so many people. Like our population is dwindling because we keep sending people to the future and they're getting fucked up because these people aren't trained. So why don't we take, look, we have years and years to prepare. Why don't we train people for this? Oh my god! And then yes, they go through those things. Just decimate people. It, 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 and Chris Pratt rolls me the wrong way, anyway. Same, so. same. Number four. Number four. Sweet girl, directed by Brian Andrew Mendoza, starring Jason Momoa in his first post Aquaman role. Jason Momoa is a charming enough gentleman. Yes, but. I feel like his little acting was wasted in this film. He has a scene where he's crying when he finds out his wife is dead. That is uncomfortably bad. But what makes it worse is it's basically like a a father-daughter like action thriller where these two people, the father-daughter, are trying to avenge the, the death of their wife mom mm-hmm. by killing the CEO of the pharmaceutical company. That didn't give her the medication that she needed. Which makes no sense. It makes no sense. Then, the twist is the daughter is imagining her dad. So what we're witnessing is her... It's kind of like that movie High High Tension. Tension, Which I do enjoy that movie more. But yes, this shit was so stupid. (laughs) It was so stupid. And when we find out the twist, there's still like an extra 30 minutes of this girl trying to find like some senator... Oh my god, it's just so dumb. The right away when the wife dies, Jason Momoa, because the CEO of the pharmaceutical company is on CNN giving an interview, and somehow Jason Momoa's character calls live live. Gets right on there. Gets right through and threatens this man on live TV saying he will kill him if his wife dies. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I knew that this movie was gonna be some bullshit from that scene. Okay. Number three. The Scary of 61st, directed by Daisha Nekrasova, which was uh, very well-reviewed, strangely, out of the Berlin Film Festival uh, this year, uh, which I didn't see there, but I had kind of built up some hopes for it because so many people seem to love it, and I am so perplexed because it is an not a well-written or performed film, uh, trying to be provocative, uh, using Jeffrey Epstein as a background, and just really ugly to look at it is not well shot we purposely avoided like lower budget indie films because it it seems unfair like when you don't have as many resources you know you're doing the best you can so we tried to keep it's like bigger budget things but this one i had to throw in because i think this film is in such poor taste because they're clearly going for that stuff that 70s style like bad acting weird camera work but then they're using a historical figure and, and what's notable about those films that it's aping that energy, those films weren't trying to be bad. They were just being. Right. <laughs> yeah, so to so to make the deliberate choice to make some bullshit and then base it on a real person who has real victims. And I'm not the most, you know, like sensitive person, 
But I thought it was disrespectful. And I, <laughs> and I, I didn't realize at the time we saw it or reviewed it that the director is no, nobly has her own very she well, has a podcast, a very well yeah. revered podcast, and etc. Blah blah blah. I just think that this needed to be handled in a much different way, or just using Epstein as the metaphor in the background, not, not even say his name, which would have been more interesting. And the thing I keep in my mind, the film that keeps coming up that's so much better that's doing this with Weinstein is Kitty Green's The Assistant. But anyhow. What's our number two? Crime Macho, directed by Clint Eastwood. Oh, he's just so old. <sighs> he's like being... <sighs> His like former boss played by Dwight Yoakam is telling him you need to go down to Mexico and get my kid from my ex-wife and I don't know. I said it in our review. I just this these white characters and their fascination with Mexican people and wanting to save Mexicans, I find really odd. And then like Dwight Yoakam's ex-wife is this beautiful woman and there's like there's no way on hell or in hell. <laughs> and then Clint Eastwood looks like he's going to fall, like turn into dust. And he meets a woman, a younger woman. She is, you know, in her probably like 60s, but still like 30 years younger than him, um, who he falls in love with. It's just a poorly directed, poorly acted, poorly written movie. The I mean, several people have been trying to make this based on a book that has been trying to get it off the ground for some time. And it probably should have been made by somebody else or years ago. Yeah. it And the poor little boy that has to act opposite him he's yeah you know Clint Eastwood has, for a long time now it, it's very well known that he take this one take uh, no rehearsal uh, using the shooting script sometimes and it almost is always evident uh, that the film that he did with uh, uh, those American soldiers that thwarted that attack on the Parisian train who play themselves in a reenactment of it I forget what the name of it is the it's the name of the train they took. Uh, that's terrible. Uh, the mule was... It's like the mule in 2018 was like, oh, this is serviceable. Cry Macho was hard to sit through. It really was. Okay, our number one pick for worst film of 2021 is... Music, directed by Sia. This shit was tone deaf. Uh, uh, it just feels like some rich you know, like artist is given carte blanche, you know, successful artist is given carte blanche to make something. And it, it, yeah, it's just tone deaf and uncomfortable. And it has the nerve to be like, you know, she features so much of her music and these big musical numbers, but these songs are like B-sides. If that. Like they're not even like hits. So it just feels very like self-absorbed. I know a lot of people had issue with a non- autistic person playing the main character music mm -hmm. i'm not going to speak to that i think the girl whatever her name jojo maddie ziegler jojo oh, it's not jojo siwa no whatever some some maddie little taller than tiara girl i i think she did the best she could sure like she was trying yes so whether you're bothered by that or not i i, I feel like she did the best job with what she was given but Kate Hudson... And I like some of this... You know, Mary-Kate Place, and I think Juliette Lewis has a fun little bit in it, but it's... Yeah, Kate Hudson as a character named Kazoo. Uh, was so annoying. And and then poor Leslie Odom. Mm, yeah, it's not good. There's so many... Watch our review. There's so many things about this movie that bothered me. Uh, and, yeah, I, I think it deserved the sort of backlash. The backlash. Well, and, you know, her own response to it was uncomfortable. Tone deaf. And tone deaf, Yeah. Uh, what else do you have to say? That's it. Uh, I, it's not really fun talking about movies that are terrible. True. Sometimes. Sometimes. But like to put them in a list, it's like, God, there was a lot of shit that came out this yeah, year. Yeah, the list was pretty <laughs> long, actually. <laughs> but uh, that's all we have. Bye. Bye. Bye.